Awesome, thank you. I'm going to turn off. Hold yes, it's One man, one projector. What will we do? <laughs> All right, um, while Charles is doing that, uh, definitely thank you, Carl, for putting this together. This is fantastic. It's so wonderful to see so many faces that are interested in VR. Yes! Um, so, um, I'm here as a VR evangelist. So I guess right now it's kind of like speaking to the choir. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, I think uh, I want to kind of pick up where Carl left off about consumer VR and VR being in the hands of millions of users. Um, it really is, I mean, I've been steeped in this stuff for months and it really is fascinating how I go to the random person, I'm like, yeah, VR is about to happen. And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and um, there's so many people that are just terribly unaware of what's happening right now, what's going on and the potential of this product and all the implications of it as well. Um, so I think that before the mainstream press and before grandma or other grandmas get a hold of this, um, that's going to be important to have a diversity or a diverse range of experiences for VR. And we're the people in this room that are going to be doing that. Uh, so we can control whether the first big story is going to be like a new porn device that you can strap on your head. Or is it going to be, you know, <laughs> or is it going to be, oh my god, you know, I'm, I'm so afraid that someone to pick up the video I made of playing Doom and I'm like, yeah, you bastard. And they're going to be like, are your children going to kill everyone on your block? You know, it's like, no, <laughs> no, please stop. Um, so I think it's going to be up to us to really make experiences that are going to cover everything. Um, really powerful moment for me was uh, I actually just saw my parents this past weekend in Vallejo. Um, and I put my, first I put my mom <laughs> in Proton Pulse. Uh, and <laughs> it was the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. <laughs> She's like, ah! <laughs> um, it was hilarious. And then I put her on the beach in Dear Esther uh, and I massaged her shoulders while that happened. <laughs> put the earphones on and she was like, ah, this is fantastic. And I was like, I know. Um, so I think that's an example of the really wonderful potential of this device uh, where it could be applied in so many places and so many uses and that's the story I want to break in Newsweek and Time and all these places. That's what I want to see like there's this new technology, this new medium for experiencing all these types of things. Not there's a gaming device and you can shoot people in first person. You know I would, uh, I would really love to see um, that breadth of experience uh, represented, which would be very, very awesome. And I think it's kind of similar to uh, the evolution of video games, where, I mean, games were at first just about fun. What's the most fun thing? There was a famous quote, I forget what developer, it was like, you know, if you get the same 30 seconds of fun, you get them hooked, right? Uh, and then things like Resident Evil and Silent Hill came along. And I don't know about you, but the first time I played those, I don't know if I would quantify that as fun. Um, but it was an experience, but I don't know if it was fun. Um, but uh, I think this is the next step uh, toward an interactive experience, not just uh, the next step in gaming as well. Um, so I'd like to really challenge everyone and inspire everyone to go out there and create a very unique experience, uh, not just a game, not just something to play, but an experience that might be changing for someone. I'm really looking forward to that. And, to the detriment of my own project, I've been making these <laughs> these videos and giving this commentary in that hope that I'm going to get reach someone out there that hasn't got the rift yet, or reach someone that has not even considered VR, which I've got some of those emails too, where like, oh my god, I didn't believe what, what I could do this, and I'm like, yes, that is fantastic, that's exactly um, what I'm doing this for. So, um, I'm just going to give a couple minutes. Let's make this interactive, like VR is interactive. So Q&A, ask me anything. AMA, let's go. Interactive, do it. One brave soul. No one. I got one. Oh! So go. how much do you think haptics is up to speed with the visuals in terms of making VR a possibility? Ooh, that is a great question. There are so many things that are not together. Um, I think my hope was would be sometime down the line there'd be a consumer edition of the Oculus Rift and that it will have like a bundle and will have like this whole thing where you're like 
Oh, but the uh, I got the best <laughs> shoot, yeah. Oh, oh. Uh, I would love that to happen. I mean, but you have these things that are really fantastic and really wonderful. Like, um, there's a uh, research. I think it was at uh, uh, Tokyo U, um, where they pretty much had a full feedback loaf, uh, which I mean, it's you can touch touch something that had like simple shapes and stuff like that, um, but you have full feedback. Um, there's some universities that uh, in the medical field they're doing some VR stuff as well, uh, where you have uh, dentist students, like uh, students in dentistry. Uh, they're basically it's really hard to communicate how hard the enamel of a tooth is, for example. Because uh, that's something you have to experience. But through haptics, they're able to do this thing where you grab the tool and the feedback is simulated. And so it shows you a difference between the hard enamel and the soft enamel, that a tooth that's about to be a cavity, things like that. So these things already exist. There's lots of haptic stuff. There's um, Tactical Haptics, I think is the name of the company. It has a really cool thing. I haven't tried it yet, but I've heard great things. So it's really, that I think the stuff is already out there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's, I mean, people hack together with even Arduino and, and string. That was like, some dude won like a hacker competition with that was fat, fantastic. He's like, it's like, I'm like, holy crap. Um, but yeah, I think it just has to be brought together. I think that's probably one of the, the steps down the line, if I had to say. I think probably positional tracking probably comes first and then uh, getting to the point where we can track everything and have our hands, we see everything, see our bodies. I think that probably comes first before Haptis gets there, in my opinion, uh, from what I'm kind of seeing and reading and all that stuff. But yeah, cool, yes? Uh, what do you think about like ethics of virtual reality like, to the point where like um, um, people may prefer virtual reality over reality reality Ooh. and um. like you know, simulating <coughs> something that looks like you know, shooting an actual person that looks like an actual person and that's a good question. I was planning to actually write something about this after my Doom video was suggested that I would do that. Um, yeah, I think one, a fascinating thing about VR that I've experienced is that NPCs have a sense of personal space. So, like, this is okay. This is starting to get uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, right? In VR, uh, I get that same feeling. Which is weird. I didn't get it in Doom because the guys are clearly like, I'm gonna get it, you know? Um, and they're like, yeah, I'm gonna get it. Uh, but in other things, like I've been playing around in UDK, I've had like my skeletal mesh character and I get close on him and I'm, I'm like, ah, oh, this is too weird. Uh, so, I don't know. It's like I've, I haven't done the normal things I would do in video games. Like when you like, you know, you're playing Half-Life 2 and you go to Alex and you're like, ah, pff, 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 ah you know, you don't, you don't do that in VR because it's a different feeling. Um, so I think that's kind of, it's a little bit of a bar. I think even the Jamie from VR, uh, VRcade, what they're doing, uh, they're saying even with virtual walls, like people won't run through them, which is very interesting. So it's, it's as if, I don't know, if you, I think a, a, people, a person would have a big problem if it was a VR simulator of shooting like actual people that weren't like monsters or zombies or something like that. And that would be, an interesting direction to take things. I'm not sure, I mean, everyone says Battlefield 3, Battlefield 3, right? Is like the game for VR, and I... People might not actually want to shoot people. Yeah, I get that feeling. Like, there's some people that might not care, and there's some people that, I, this really isn't the experience I want. This is a little too close, um, too close to home. Um, I didn't play Grand Theft Auto San Andreas for the same reason. It was a, too, too close. It was like, you know what? If I wanted to go back to the ghetto, I'd just go. <laughs> um, so, I don't know, I think it might be that same type of situation uh, where it's, it's there. I, as far as the situation is, is people escaping from real reality into VR, I think that's probably more of a concern than a violent thing. Um, I mean, we've seen crime, violent crime go down since the rise of video games, really. So, I think that whole argument about desensitizing and stuff, I don't think it's very, very founded. It doesn't seem to be a lot of scientific proof behind it. But um, the escaping, I can definitely, definitely see. Like I spent about two hours in, in the virtual cinema watching movie from Nami Ellis. I don't know if some of you might have heard of that. It's really cool. Um, but I spent two hours in there and after the movie was done, I had no idea where I was. I had no sense of the real world. And it was really scary. <laughs> I was like, what, 
what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> is my computer there or there? Um, I don't know. So I think that sense of detachment is definitely going to be a concern uh, where there's going to be some people just to, as a matter of their personality, they're just going to be like, you know what, real life sucks. <laughs> And I can spend a weekend and play Star Citizen and sleep with the ripped on and wake up and I'm still in the spaceship and that's cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, God. And I see people doing that. Like, so I'm virtual. There are going to be some people that are going to be doing that, you know? It's like, and I'm, I'm not sure how that problem is going to be approached. I mean, as designers, what do we do about that? One more. Yes, go. Um, so I had a great first experience with the Rift two days ago in an airport flying into the Bay Area. Nice. Very serendipitous. But the woman who was with me felt sick after like two minutes. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's actually a reasonably common experience. And I'm wondering if there's any research on whether those people can overcome it with time or if, or if they're just kind of stuck that way. Yeah. Uh I haven't found a whole lot of research per se. There was a rumor of like a Sega that was Carl had a picture of that, the Sega VR device that they mm -hmm. wanted to do with the Genesis, I think. Um, and there was something about sickness being a factor, um, but I haven't found really a lot of scientific stuff. Most of the stuff is anecdotal, like uh, Joe Ludwig at Valve was like, uh, seven out of 10 people are felt sick. And in my experience, it hasn't been that high, like it hasn't been 70%. Um, I've had one middle-aged white lady at work really uh, tear into it. She's like, what's next? And I'm like, holy crap. She didn't feel a thing. And then I had a young woman, she got on and she was like, okay, like after two minutes. So I don't know, it's been a lot of anecdotal stuff. Like that post on Reddit about the guy that's like, I played the riff for a few days and now I don't even get car sick. Like it was like a type of therapy, which is pretty interesting. Um, as opposed to people, I mean, my personal experience was that the first day I felt pretty bad. Um, chug some ginger ale, but that was probably because I did like 15 to 20 different pieces of software, no matter how bad or good. And I was like, yeah, the riff is awesome. And uh, so I didn't feel too good about the first day, but after that I was good. So, I mean, I, I show it to a bunch of people at Cisco and most of the crowd seem to be cool there. The people I've shown, like when I've taken it to work and stuff like that, it was about maybe half and half, mm -hmm. uh, depending on what those, those folks did. And I think, a positional tracking and some whether a person is standing or sitting down also contributes to how quickly, and of course the software experience too. One thing to add, calibration. Calibration, yes, the IPD that can that can have a factor. If you have eye strain, that's I mean your head's kind of starting to pound, so that can contribute too. It seems like there's uh, lots of literature from the military using simulators for training for lots of years, but you know quite often those things aren't published like on the study would be. Totally, absolutely. Um, I'm hoping for that same thing too. Just like the, uh, what was the guy, Uni Engine, I think. Those guys are very much affiliated with, with uh, military and stuff like that. So they've been out some compatibility. So hopefully we'll start to see some of that information, which would be great. And Palmer has collections there too, so. Yes? This point is the most important point to be made here. These whole issues that, that uh, people finding where it's, getting dizzy and all, it's because none of the developers have actually spent time with developing dedicated design software for VR. The Rift, which is a great beginning of, of, of a revolution, as I, I refer to, even though it's been there before, deserves some companies like Valve, and that's why we do it. We are not as, as big as Valve, of course, but <laughs> but Valve should, rather than trying to port games that were built for mouse and keyboard and 2D monitors, they should go in with the unlimited resources they have and they should develop the content that is designed for it. And then they will make sure that there's no, you know, no, no issues that will be resolved. I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, one of the interesting things I found out when I tried the Tuscany demo, I always get dizzy, still. After weeks in a rift, I still get dizzy because there's no head bob. And if I have a head bob in a game, I feel great. And to the point where I add my own <laughs> if, it's, if it's not there. Um, and those are the type of things where you have to give a player choice. Like, you know, because the conventional wisdom before was like, head bob is a no-no. You don't mess with the horizon. Joe Ludwig said so, he's from Valve, and he knows everything. And, uh, and it turned out, I played it, I was like, no, that's not the case. So absolutely, finding out 
what works and what doesn't. Even, what what do you give players choice with and what doesn't? I think yeah, totally. But very even, important. But even talking about 